Well, hey guys, welcome back to another week of work in progress. This week we're switching it up a little bit and we'll be looking at a psalm. We'll be looking at Psalm 51 led out by Ravana. And as usual, can I have two volunteers, a volunteer to sing a prayer for us and a volunteer to pray, please. Either one? Is that what you just said? All right. Vicky, you can sing and I will pray. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wow, so anytime you're ready. <laughs> I'm so surprised. <laughs> wow, who the fuck? <laughs> I'm <really ready. laughs> All right, let's us bow our souls, our minds in reverence as we begin. Seeking first the kingdom of God. And his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord, hallelujah, hallelujah. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, amen. Amen. Let us pray. Most loving and faithful Father, thank you once more for putting us together. Like this, God, thank you, God, for, you know, all the things that we've been through in the past week, for the ups and downs, and thank you for being there with us through it all. I pray, Lord, that as we get ready, prepare our minds, our hearts, and our souls to dive into your word, I pray, Lord, that you open our minds, help us to hear from you. I pray, Lord, that you allow us to, to, for you to speak through us, God. I pray, Lord, that during this time that we will truly decrease and allow you to increase in every way, Lord. We give you thanks, Father. Forgive us for our sins. And I pray, Lord, that this Bible study, that we won't leave here the same way that we came. We love you, God. Thank you for loving us more than our little minds can even imagine. In your son's holy and precious name we pray. Amen. All right, guys. So as I said, we've been looking at Psalm 51 today, and we've been led by Ravana. So over to you, Ravi. Hi guys. Oh no, oh my gosh, that's so formal. I don't like it. I'm so sorry, Ravi. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. So good night again. As Julie said, we're going to go through Psalm 51. Um, so just like an introduction. So Psalm 51 is really like a renowned like prayer of repentance from David. Um, after he fell into some serious sin. And he recognized his need to plead with God for forgiveness. And um, the backstory behind all of this is in um, 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12. A reading from the word, 2 Samuel 11. Then it happened in the spring, at the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Job and his servants with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the sons of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David stayed at Jerusalem. Now when evening came, David arose from his bed and walked around on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful in appearance. So David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, 
Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam and the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her. And when she came to him, he lay with her. And when she had purified herself from her uncleanness, she returned to her house. And the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, and said, I am pregnant. Then David sent to Job, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. So Job sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked concerning the welfare of Job and the people and the state of the war. Then David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. And Uriah went out of the king's house, and a present from the king was sent out after him. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord, and did not go down to his house. Now when they told David, saying, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, Have you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? And Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah are staying in temporary shelters, and my lord Job and the servants of my, lo of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? By your life and the life of your soul, I will not do this thing. Then David said to Uriah, Stay here today, also, and tomorrow I will let you go. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. Now David called to him, and he ate and drank before him, and he made him drunk, and in the evening he went out to lie on his bed with his lord's servants, but he did not go down to his house. Now it came about in the morning that David wrote a letter to Job and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he had written in the letter, saying, Place Uriah in the front line of the fiercest battle and withdraw from him, so that he may be struck down and die. So it is as Job kept watch on the city that he put Uriah at the place where he knew there were valiant men. And the men of the city went out and fought against Job. And some of the people among David's servants fell, and Uriah the Hittite also died. Then Job sent and reported to David all the events of the war. And he charged the messenger, saying, When you have finished telling all the events of the war to the king, and if it happens that the king's wrath rises and he says to you, Why did you go so near to the city to fight? Did you not know that they will shoot from the wall? Who struck down Abimelech? the son of Jerub Jerubeth Sheth. Did not a woman throw an upper millstone on him from the wall so that he died at Thebes? Why did you go so near the wall? Then you shall say, Your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. So the messenger departed and came and reported to David all that Job had sent him to tell. And the messenger said to David, the men prevailed against us and came out against us in the field, but we pressed them as far as the entrance of the gate. Moreover, the archers shot at your servants from the wall. So some of the king's servants are dead, and your servant Uriah the Hittite is also dead. Then David said to the messenger, Thus you shall say to Job, Do not let this thing displease you, for the sword devours one as well as another. Make your battle against the city stronger, and overthrow it, and so encourage him. And when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. When the time of mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife. Then she bore him a son. But the thing that David had done was evil in the sight of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. So, going to go over into chapter 12. Are you guys following? I hope you are. Um, so now, okay, yes. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. 
No, a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all Israel and Judah, and if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonite, Ammonites. Now therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Out of your household, I'm going to bring calamity on you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to who is close to you. And he will sleep with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, The Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. But because by doing this you have shown utter contempt for the Lord, the son born to you will die. After Nathan had gone home, the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife had born to David, and he became ill. David pleaded with God for the child. He fasted and spent the nights laying in, lying in sackcloth on the ground. The elders of his household stood beside him to get him up from the ground, but he refused, and he would not eat any food with them. On the seventeenth day, the child on the seventh day, sorry, the child died. David's attendants were afraid to tell him that the child was dead, for they thought, while the child was still living, he would listen to us when we spoke to him. How can we now tell him that the child is dead? He may do something desperate. David noticed that his attendants were whispering among themselves, and he realized the child was dead. Is the child dead? he asked. Yes, they replied, he is dead. Then David got up from the ground. After he had washed, put on lotions, and changed his clothing, he went into the house of the Lord, and he worshipped. Okay, I feel like I'll end. I'll end there. Amen. Okay, so, yes, that is the backstory. So we see all that was happening here, how David sinned against the Lord. David thief, Uriah's wife, sleep with her, got her pregnant. And then made a whole plan to get rid of Uriah. And when that happened, he took his wife, Uriah's wife, to be his own and so on. So, and then we see the prophet Nathan now came to him to give him some insight on what he has done. And um, it's, it's, it, it is after that encounter that David really came to realize what he has done and know in Psalm 51 it's going to show how he came to God in repentance and asking for forgiveness. Yes. Okay. So now Psalm 51. Um, can I have someone just to read Psalms 51 in full for me and then we can break it down together. Any volunteers? And just to be clear, you guys are following? Okay. You're following. All right. Mm -hmm. So just someone to um, read Psalm 51 and then we break it down together. I'll go. Oh, okay. to the choir you. master. Oh. Uh. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I didn't know somebody was going. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> to the choir master, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone to Bethel. Be 
Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgression, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in the truth in the, in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret of my heart. Purge me with hypsum, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Believe me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise, for you will delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then will you delight in the right sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered onto your altar. Amen. Thank you, Kira. All right. Um, so just going to be a little introduction before we start going into the verses. So here in Psalm 51, um, we can see the heartfelt cry to God from David who has committed sin. Psalm 51, it really gives us a model of how to approach God when we've been convicted of sin. You have to approach God with a spirit of humility and repentance without making excuses or blaming others and having confidence that God will forgive those who sincerely seek mercy. Um, yes, as it says in Hebrews 4, verse 15 to 16, it says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Amen. All right. So now we're going to go more into the verses and just, just discuss and see what you guys get from it. How does it relate to you and just your thoughts on everything. All right. So just going to do verses one to two first. And I'll just read again. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. Amen. So, putting it out there now, what does it say to you guys? What stands out to you here in David's approach? To God right here. Go ahead, Jules. Okay, so um the Hebrew for mercy that is used here is has said, which means loyal love or forgiveness that is inexhaustible. And I just love that. I love that it is inexhaustible because I don't know about you guys, but there are times when, although I know that God's mercies are new every morning, I can't help sometimes. I mean, I can, but the the human side of me sometimes likes to look at God for my 
human perspective as well. You know, someone who's going to get tired of me, but his mercy is inexhaustible. There's nothing that you can do that was going, that's going to make God tired of you. So, you know, we can always call to God to have mercy on us with his unfailing love. Like, I love that never fails. That's just absolutely beautiful and encouraging to me. Amen. Love that, Jules. Thanks. Thank you so much. And I like how the first statement that David says is, Have mercy on me, O God. Showing that coming to God first, I mean, in coming to God sometimes, when you have sinned, you know, you feel some type of guilt, some type of shame. But if you really understand how merciful God is, having this loyal love towards us, it kind of gives you that comfort that even though I have done something bad, I know God is there for me to go to. And he will not love me any less. He still have his loyal love for me. So thanks, Jules, for that. Um, any other comments on the first two verses? Go ahead, Nikki. And then in the um King James version, the first verse says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. And I I absolutely love the combination of those two words, loving kindness, because that's one of the things that I find quite um, what should I say? No, like one of the things I love about God is that his his love is always kind. It is not a brutal love. It is not a um, you know, like Julie was saying, the tired of you, I'm fed up of you, whatever. It's like even in the middle of all of this, I can trust that when I turn to God, um, he is kind. And it kind of brings me back to what Nathan said, right? The moment, um, the moment David repented and David responded and said, I have sinned against the Lord. I mean, Nathan went on to speak about all the things he has done and so on. And in response to that, David says, I have sinned against the Lord. And immediately Nathan responds, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. So I, I appreciate the fact that God is always going to be so welcoming. And I love the King James version of it that says, according to your loving kindness. That's one of the things that is one of the greatest um, characteristics of God is that his love is forever kind. So I just wanted to point out. Amen. Thank you so much for that, Vicky. Anybody else? Okay. Oh, yes. Julie had put up her hand. I forgot. Julie and then Kira. Kira can go first. All right, Kira. Go first. <laughs> um, when he says, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Thoroughly. Like, he really wanted to be forgiven you know how sometimes you tell a lie and you're like oh lord just forgive me for telling a lie yeah but next time me find one different lie or like you know you find a way how to make a leeway to sin again so he he was like really he was really ashamed of what he did so he was like wash me thoroughly from my iniquity like he really wanted to be just forgiven for the sin that he did Yeah, I love that here. My point is actually kind of around the same route. Um, I love how relatable the psalm is. I have felt stained by my sin before, like to the point where I'm crying out and calling to God, like I need a new body because this sin, it feels like it has engrossed me. I am I'm stained. I literally feel stained. And I'm just realizing that in the first verse, 
well, for the NLT version, it says, blot out the stain of my sins. And then that brings me back to a verse that I held really close to my heart during the time that I felt stained. And it's Isaiah 1 verse 18, and it says, Come now, let's take a verse, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them as white as snow. Though they are as red as crimson, I will make them as white wool. And, you know, scarlet, back in those days, is a dye that was very permanent. It wasn't a dye that it was easy to be reversed or to be bleached out. It was something very permanent. So to compare your skin as, uh, as scarlet, you know, it, it's a stain. But God, God said that he's able to make you white as snow. And, you know, for someone that feels so hopeless and fed up of your own sin, for God to tell you that he will make you white as snow, that is, man, it's, it's an unexplainable feeling, honestly. So for David to be saying, you know, blot out the stain of my sins, God can easily do that for me and for David and for everybody else here. God can easily make our sin that is as scarlet as white as snow. I really love that. Amen. Amen. Really love that, Jules. Um, any other comments before I move on to the next two verses? Okay, Brandon, go ahead. Yeah, amazing conversation so far. There are just a few verses I want to read to to add to the conversation. So the first one is found in Isaiah chapter 44, and I'm going to read verse 22. It says, I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions, and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. You know, a lot of times when we talk about this idea of you know, going to God for forgiveness, we think about it as, all right, God is a, a fixture over there and I need to just simply, or as much as it's possible, strive towards him. But the language of Isaiah 44 verse 22 is almost the welcoming embrace of a father who's saying, I see your sin, I see your dirtiness, come back, come here. And it's impossible for me to to talk about that without the imagery of the prodigal son, son just popping up in my mind. You know, a lot of times when people think about God, they think about this, you know, big God up there and, you know, naturally sin separating us. But the type of God that we serve when he sees us striving towards that mark, him knows us stay where he is and say, all right, cool, let me see how far you need to come. Now he runs with open arms to grab us up. And to greet us. And verse 23 of Isaiah 44 says this in recognition of the fact that that's a God that we serve. Here's what Isaiah 44 23 says It says, Sing, O you heavens, for the Lord has done it. So to you lower parts of the earth, break forth into singing, you mountains. O forest and every tree therein, for the Lord has redeemed Jacob and glorified himself in Israel. In other words, God is so much longing for to embrace us after we have you know, made the mistake of falling, that in recognition of that type of God, we should sing forth in the way that Isaiah 44 verse 23 says. He doesn't just want us to, you know, in the face of our sin, be sad. He wants us to find joy in the fact that we serve a God who loves us and wants to embrace us and bring us back to where we were before. And then another verse of scripture that I'd love to read is um, Psalms 103 verse 11. Julie made reference to it before when she was talking about the inexhaustible nature of God's mercy. But Psalms 103 verse 11 in my mind, almost, it, it paints the picture in my mind in a different way. It says, for as a heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards them that, that fear him. And I don't know y'all, but I don't have no measuring tape that can can measure the distance from heaven to earth. A matter of fact, the only metric that I know that can measure the distance from heaven to earth is Jesus Christ himself, because he's a chain that connects the love of heaven to the fallen ones on earth. And 
to that, I just say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, indeed. Amen. Thank you so much for that, Brandon. Any other comments before we move on to verse 3 and 4? Brandon, your hand is up again? Or... Yeah, that was a third point that kind of slipped me. Mm -hmm. I, I like that David, in his language, challenges a perspective that you know, so many people who struggle with sin have. You know, sometimes we have this tendency to want to get ourselves better before we go back to God, where we try to clean ourselves off and fix up our bad ways before returning to God. Yeah, David wasn't on that wavelength. David literally said, yo, I'm dirty. Lord, you are the only person that can wash me. Um, and the Bible is so clear when it says, you know, in as much as a leopard is able to change its spots or an Ethiopian change the color of his skin, so too are you who are um, who do evil can do good. In other words, it's impossible. The, to try and clean yourself up and pretty yourself up or try to change your bad ways before going back to God, it, it's just not going to work. And that's why David says, Lord, you wash me because I can't wash myself. I need you to help me. I need you to deal with my bad ways. And, you know, for a person who has struggled in his fair share of sinful tendencies, trying to do this on your own is it's, it's not going to work. It leaves you being frustrated and exhausted and that's why jesus tells us in that verse that you read Rav, earlier to come to him boldly amen beautifully said thank you okay Jules, go ahead Jules, do you have a mistake Sorry, I didn't realize my bad. But okay. yeah, I was saying that <laughs> I was saying that if you realize that David didn't ask to be filled first, he asked to be cleaned and to be purified, basically, to be emptied, right? And you know, so often in prayer we go to God and it's like, fill me up, God, fill me up. But what we really need is to be emptied first, is to be clean, so that we can actually have space to be filled with whatever God needs to fill us with. And that made me remember um, Naomi when we were looking at that story. And I, I can't see that story the same way anymore, honestly. But seeing how, and, and the point that Vicky had made, how Naomi had to be emptied first before she could be filled with her blessing. Yeah, that's what I'm seeing right here. David had to be emptied first before he could become clean, before he could have gotten that new heart. Amen. Amen. As soon as you said that, I remembered exactly what Vicky had said too. <laughs> that will never leave my mind. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so we'll do verse 3 and 4. So I'll just read. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict, and justified when you judge. Amen. Um, in these verses, for me, one of the um, major things here is acknowledging before God your transgressions and your sins without any excuses or shifting blame or no type of justification just be real just own up to it that you have done these things and you know that they are wrong um as we've been talking about how merciful god is just understanding how he is um that will help us in being able to be accountable and acknowledging all that we have done before him um, so that is one of the um, things that stuck out to me here. Um, another thing that stuck out to me was where it says, my sin is always before me. And in the NLT version, I, I believe it says that it haunts me day and night, <laughs> which is true, very relatable, because sometimes you do. You do um commit this sin 
and you are well aware of it sometimes you may be in denial or you try to ignore or try to escape or sometimes it's just guilt but we as um children of god like david was it is really hard to escape it because it literally is going to haunt you day and night because you're gonna feel it in your spirit that you have done something wrong and i think i had something to read about that let me just find it um okay it says here many people run away from god and hide from him precisely in those moments when they need him the most shame due to one's own sinfulness an inability to change much with one's own efforts it distances a person from god it is not easy to admit your weakness and your sin it is not easy to ask for forgiveness it is not easy to ask for mercy and it is even harder when you have to do it over and over again the problem is even bigger because we humans assign ourselves the main role in the process of change while god has a completely different plan god is the one who forgives and restores and through the perfect sacrifice of jesus christ that opens for us the surest way to real change and the way to a pure clean heart amen so now to you guys what are your thoughts on these verses Go ahead, Vicky. So like you, almost every time I read this chapter, the thing that always, always screams out to me first is that part that says my sin is always before me. And of course, the NLT version says it haunts me day and night. And trust me, it, I hear you guys talking about poverty, so that is, but it's not just like, oh, you, you commit a sin. For me, it's not just like you commit a sin and it's just haunting you. For me, it's also the haunting of the past, right? Like sometimes you like you you live a whole life, right? Like I became a Christian in my 30s, right? So I live like 30 years a sin, right? And then become a Christian. And then sometimes I find myself even questioning myself when I I'm supposed to do things or share a word or even post things. Um, sometimes I wonder, you know, do people like say, Vicky, that the Vicky there, Christian, you know, the way they say it's almost like your past kind of haunts you sometimes. And you're like, you know, always. So that's what always comes to my mind when I when I read that. That is not just one act or act of sin for me personally. It's like just like your tendencies, your default mode, your past, like those are the things that haunt me personally when I, whenever I read this. And um, I love when I read stories like, um, like the woman who was caught in the act of adultery or even Mary Magdalene or even Peter, our favorite Peter, um, when we read those stories that, and Rahab, of course, especially Rahab, whenever you read those st stories of how um, our past does not disqualify us to be used in powerful ways by God. And a lot of times, even when our sin is before us, when our past is before us, we can, you know, call on these amazing examples who were even recorded in the um the the hall of faith as we call it Hebrews 11 as really powerful people of God so I just wanted to um share that love that Vicky thanks so much for sharing that and I I can somewhat relate so I understand where you are coming from so thank you for sharing that um Betty P you had raise your hand I oh, hi again, guys. Um, the part that stood out to me the most is in verse 4, where it says, Against you, you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Right? So um, I was listening to this guy's testimony sometime during this week, where he was 
sharing a fun experience that he, he was an unbeliever, right? And he had taken some drugs and he had this whole experience where he was in hell. And he was talking about um, just the crushing weight of feeling like, like constantly replaying the, the sins that he had, he had done in his life. At the time, he was an unbeliever, so he does really under, he, does, he didn't really understand you know, what kind of sin he was that he had in his life. But in the experience, he could feel the weight of his sin and knowing how wrong he was, right? So, like, one thing that, you know, when Judgment Day comes is that um, God, one of his attributes is that he's just, right? So he's just like David says, he's justified in his words and blameless in his judgment, right? So all, one, one thing that um, I kind of worry about a lot for my unbelieving friends especially is how, like, I always worry about them when it comes to judgment day. Like how, especially for a person, not just my friend, but like persons in the world who have never heard about Jesus, that's one thing that's always kind of on my mind, especially when I was in China and I'm walking around and I seen like these Chinese people every day and they've never, most of them don't even know the word Jesus. They don't know anything about it. And I'm always wondering about that, right? But I have to accept that God is just, and you know, he will judge even the persons who never heard Jesus's name rightly and also give thanks that you know i got to experience the saving grace of jesus for my own sins you know and i think that's something that i'm grateful for but also kind of worry about it for other persons you know they that won't get to experience that love and that mercy i'm making any sense that making any sense you guys understand yeah. what i'm saying <laughs> Yes, you make perfect sense. <laughs> yeah. Um, Alina, go ahead. Alina, your hand was up. Oh, sorry, I didn't unmute. <laughs> this is why I never join my mind. <laughs> no, I was saying sorry I'm late. I was on the road and I had to come back in and get ready, but um yeah. So what I just got from this is I was looking for the verse and then I think I think I found the one I was looking for. Romans 6, verse 1 to 4. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who are baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized into death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that as Jesus Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. There are two things I was thinking about here as you guys were saying, like, I completely relate to what you're saying before this verse, like the whole thing, like shame and guilt making you not even approach Jesus when that's really what you're supposed to do. Like the devil will play tricks on your mind and try to make you like run away from God when literally when you do sin, he's the first, like you need to go to God right away. Like that is the moment when you're like, listen, God, right now, what's going on? Why am I even doing this? Because I think sometimes it's like you're falling into these patterns. And as Brandon was saying earlier, you can't dig yourself out of this hole by yourself. Like if you're going to fight this by yourself and say, no, I'm going to clean up and then go to God, it just not going to work out more well. But then also, like when it said in verse four, against you, you alone, I have sinned and done this evil in your sight. It's like it was, it was kind of making me think of this verse because I'm like, okay, and we baptized, we said, okay, like we're putting this old life behind, but even though we're baptized, like we still, we still go there. So it's like, there's this disappointment kind of like in yourself and that shame. I think that's where it's coming from, where, you know, when you got baptized, you were accepting this new life, but then even after you baptize, you find yourself kind of in the same lifestyle. And I think it's like one, you have to give yourself a grace. Yes. But you need to be in that grace. Yes. There's always room for grace, but that doesn't excuse where repentance needs to happen like right away same way you know what i mean it's like yes there's grace there 
because yes, we know when you're baptized, you'll come to the water and just tomorrow you just don't sin anymore. Like that's not how that works. But in that grace, you know what I mean? There still should be like this eagerness and this recognition. And I think Vicky was saying this accountability um, of the sin that you did so that you can get out of that. And then another thing I was thinking about when, so sorry, I missed your name before. You were just speaking before me. Betty P, I see you. Yeah. Um, when you were talking about um, just fretting over your friends and your family members who have not received Christ and those who haven't heard the gospel. What I was thinking about when you said that is that in Matthew 24, verse 14, they were saying that the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. And so I believe that the gospel will be preached and it will land in everybody's ears at some point, but it just comes down to are they going to make the right decision of... Because again, as you said, God is just, right? So I believe everybody's going to have a fair judgment in the end. It's not going to be like some people never hear and then, oh, no, they never hear. So that's why it got, no. Like, I believe it will fall on the ears of everybody. And it's our, as we're commissioned to do, to spread the gospel. Like you're saying, you're passing some people on the road and you say, man, they probably don't know Jesus. It's like, tell them about Jesus then. You know what I mean? It's like, I know sometimes it kind of frightening to do stuff like that, but whenever you are comfortable enough and you can find a way to tell somebody about Jesus, do it. Yes, something that I think we also need to recognize is that it will be awkward. Like, that's something I have to start telling myself. Like, you're going to try and bring up God at some point in some conversation somewhere with somebody I don't know about him, and it's going to be weird, and it's going to be uncomfortable. But hell is way more uncomfortable <laughs> than the conversation, how it's going to start. And so I think that's just something that you have to think about as well, that you know, just feel, I know it's tough to walk with random people, but, you know, like, if it's even one person, you know what I mean? You say one person, you say that person is down. Let me tell them about Jesus. You know, what they do that information, they do that information. But I feel like Christians have to kind of take up the charge a bit more to spread the gospel because that is literally what we're commissioned to do. And that is how Matthew 24 verse 14 is going to be fulfilled by us actually spreading the gospel and making it touch everybody's ears. Yeah. I think we talked about this too, like last year at some point, but yeah, <laughs> just wanted to bring that back. Amen. Amen. Beautifully said, Alina. Loved every point that you made. Um, thank you. Yeah. Well said. I have nothing to add. <laughs> um, does anybody else have anything else to add? Okay. Go ahead, Brenda. <laughs> Yeah, that was a really great point by Elena there. Uh, just some other stuff to add, add uh, verse 3. I think there's such a key difference between true repentance and, and what isn't repentance. And I think David's confession here and comparing that to that of Pharaoh's helps us to understand that difference. David acknowledged his sin and he recognized that what he did was wrong. But we see in Pharaoh's case, he acknowledged the consequences and so there was a drive, a different driving force in in both cases. In the case of David, he acknowledged how his sin hurt God and and in his own mind kind of affected that relationship or that space. Whereas Pharaoh's concern was simply how the consequences of his sin affected him. And it's so important that that distinction is is drawn. Am I is a reason why I'm going to God for repentance or because I'm scared of what outcome I'm scared of what will happen to me because of this sin, or am I going to God because I see how my choices have hurt him and how it has hurt our space and you know so there's a a key difference between those two, and I think verse four is also really important, the part that says that thou mayest be justified when thou speakest and clear when thou judgest from the place of David, this was somebody who knew better this was David who you know, knew that God provided him the strength not to sin. He knew that he should have avoided certain trigger spaces. David knew all of that. This is the same David who was a, a man after God's own heart. He he was aware of everything God was and planned to do for him to help him not to sin. And for me, that's why I think David can say the statement so clearly in the sense that God, anything that you and a consequence as a result of these things, whenever you pour that judgment on me, you would have been fair. Because at every single point along the way, I know you would have provided me the strength not to sin. 
I know you would have provided me the ways of escape. I know you would have done all of these things. And ultimately, that is why the justice of God reigns supreme. And sometimes we think about God's justice as simply the retribution at the end of time for, you know, all the bad people and all the bad things that they do. But I don't think about it like that. I think of God's justice as every act of love that he has performed along the journey of our lives to allow us to hear the words well done. That is what makes God just, that he would have done everything in his power to save us. He would have done everything in his power to help bring us up back after we've fallen into sin. To me, that's what makes God just. Amen, amen. I love that, man, and I love how, because I've never thought of it in that way in terms of how God is just. So thank you for sharing that. Um, any other thoughts or comments before we move on to the next verses? Okay, Jules, go ahead. You know what I find very interesting? In verse 4, where it says, Against you and you only have I sinned. I'm thinking, what about poor Uriah with it? Or Bathsheba? Or himself? Or in people? You know, he didn't specify those people. He said, against God. And God only has he sinned. And I'm trying to figure out why. And I'm thinking, you know, <clears throat> you know how sometimes we're we're caught in a sin and we feel so bad because of how it affects somebody else or how it affects us. But David's focus is on the right thing. He isn't fo he isn't focused on how it's affecting Bathsheba. Though yes what he did is completely wrong to those people as well and they are having their bad end of the stick as well but he sinned against god that's the important thing and that is why he is repentant and that's why we should also be repentant not when our sin gets um, catches up with us or when somebody else is upset because of what we've done, but because, <clears throat> sorry, but because we have gone against what God has told us to do. You know, the second that we go against anything that God has told us to do, that's when we should be repentant. Yeah, so it's something that I noticed, and yeah, that's it. <laughs> Amen. Love that insight, Julie. Thank you. Any other comments before I move on to the next two verses? No. Okay. So I'll read. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. What do you guys get from these two verses? For me, what I really picked up from these two verses um, is that, you know, we as all humans, we were born into sin. We have a sinful nature. And not to say that it is okay to sin, but to know that if you do fall short, there is redemption in Jesus Christ. And the fact that he mentioned, um, yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Um, for me, it kind of shows how God has been with us from the beginning, from even before we were in the womb, when we were in the womb now. Um, it shows that every step of the way or every moment in life, he is there with you. So it gives also it gives me some comfort knowing that if I should fall, he's there to catch me or pick me up if I have fallen short. Yes, Brandon, go ahead. 
powerful, etc. Um, my take on it is what God expects of us, despite, you know, when you read verse five, you know, David lays plain the fact that, you know, he was born and shaped in iniquity. But then he goes on to say, but despite that, you expect something from me. And, you know, sometimes you, the the vantage point of somebody from outside the space of Christianity would be, that's an unfair expectation. How can God expect um, you know, truth from the inward parts of somebody who was born in sin and shaped in iniquity. Isn't that an unfair and unjust expectation? But for those of us who exist within the space of God's love and everything that he has done for us, it isn't an unjust expectation. And, and here's why. Despite our sinful natures, the power of grace far exceeds the power of sin. And I think when we come to accept that, we realize that God gives us far more in that expectation than the pull of sin is. There's a verse of scripture I'd love to read in Second Peter 1 verses 3 and 4. It says, according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. In other words, God is saying, yeah, I know that because of the fall of Adam, you're born and shaping it in iniquity. I know that. But here's what. I want to recreate something in you. I want to give you access to divine nature, divine nature that is far more powerful than the pull of sinful nature. And it's because of that why I can expect something more from you, because I give you the power of heaven to resist the power of sin. And you know, so much times we we'll say, we we'll say, you know, um, where sin abound, grace did much more abound. And in my mind, this is evidence of that, that despite we're born and shaped in iniquity, the power of God emboldens us, emboldens us in such a way where God expects us to live like Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus Christ lives in us. Powerful, powerful. Beautifully said. Thank you, Brandon. Anybody have anything to add to that? Or whatever you have gotten from these two verses? <clears throat> no? Okay. Um, so we can move on to verses 7 to 9. And I'll read. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquity. What do you guys get from these verses? Um, what's hyssop? What's his up? Does anybody? <laughs> I've never heard that one. Go ahead, Brandon. Yeah. Alena, you should have been here for Bible study, like, what was it, like three weeks ago, where we were looking at, you know, the significance of the hyssop in, in, in scripture. The first time hyssop is actually mentioned is on the first Passover. So the hyssop is like a herb or a bush, really. And the first evidence of hyssop in the Bible is in the book of Exodus, where God instructs the children of Israel still in Egypt on that first Passover to take the hyssop and dip it in the blood of the lamb and to cover their doorposts with it, that when the death angel should pass by, their houses would be covered and those people would be delivered. And we're also discussing that the time that we see hyssop in the New Testament is actually at another Passover. And this Passover is at the death of Jesus Christ. While he's on the cross, hyssop is being, vinegar and hyssop is being given to him when he says he thirsts. And the next statement he makes subsequent to that is, it is finished. And so we're just, you know, in awe in that Bible study of how beautifully the Bible paints that picture of how hyssop is always used in these contexts of protection, of deliverance. In the case of, you know, Egypt, 
duly dropped the verse in the scripture there and then in the context of our ultimate salvation in Jesus Christ. So I think it's quite fitting that David again pivots to the same herb, that same bush that has always represented cleansing and deliverance in the Bible. Amen. Yes. <laughs> Yes, and um, also going back to what Julie had said, just in like recognizing that no matter how dirty or deep or stain of sin is, God is able to restore our purity and cleanse us every time, every single time you go back to him, dirty, stained, stain can't remove God can remove it you just have to believe that and it there's proof there's proof that god can remove it so yes um any other thoughts about these verses from you guys <clears throat> go ahead brenda Julie can go first. Oh, mine isn't long. I just want to make a point about the, the Hebrew. So I don't remember which um version it was reading, but in which version I was reading, but instead of purify me, it says purge me. And the Hebrew that's used there is chata, which means to de-sin me. So I really find that cool. And I don't know, like reading through this, I just want to give David a hug, especially where he says, oh, give me back my joy again. You have broken me. Now let me rejoice. I can just imagine what David was feeling during that time, like the guilt and the shame and the, the heaviness of everything that he was going through. And he's asking back for his joy, you know? So it's not really a big point, it's just the Hebrew, which means so decent, and so I wish I could help David. You can go ahead, Brandon. Yeah, I was just doing a little bit of reflection lately when I was reading this verse, and I was like, I find it so strange that a lot of times Christians get so caught up in identifying with their dirtiness and their sin and their shame. And I was just like, have I ever like said those words, I am clean? Like the Bible goes to great extents to, to say that through Jesus Christ, we have been cleansed, that we are clean. And so many times you hear Christians talk about the, the shame and the filthiness of their sin, so much so that you say that it's like a part of your personality. But then Jesus is like, nah, that I didn't come for you guys to identify with the shame and guilt and the sinfulness of sin. When we're looking at John 15, there was a verse um, that really caught my eye in John 15, verse 3. It says, now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Not a future tense at some point in time you will be clean. But right now you are clean. And I found that fascinating. You know, and I, I'm guilty of it. Like so much time I talk about, yeah, man, the guilt and shame of all of these things. Exactly. Like we hold on to that past identity, Julie. And then Jesus is just like, yo, I cast that into the sea of forgetfulness. Like as far as the east is from the west, that's how far I remove your transgressions from you. Why are you trying to hold that up? Why are you trying to, to, to hold on to what I have already told you is gone? You're clean. Own that up. You are clean through me. Full stop. Period. Amen. Love that, Renan. Thank you for that. <clears throat> Julie is clean. Good. Rav is clean. I am clean. We are all clean. In Jesus, amen. Um, any other thoughts before we move on to the next couple of verses? <clears throat> okay, I'll read the next few verses from 10 to 13. Created me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation 
and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressor, transgressors your ways, so that sinners will turn back to you. Amen. Powerful few verses. I leave the floor open. What do you guys have to say? Okay, I'll start off. Um, create in me a pure heart, creating me a clean heart. That is a major step in cleanliness, in your walk with God. So Julie said something. Create a, a brand new heart, yes. And um, one verse. Um, I can go back to it. That is Ezekiel 36, verse 26, which says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Amen. So God is the only person we can go to who will give us this new heart, who will remove all our transgressions, remove our... The, the the uncleanliness from our heart the the heart of stone and and give you one of flesh a brand new heart one for you to start over for you not to reflect in the sins that you've committed or reflect in your past but in this new person that you are through jesus christ giving you this new heart a fresh start um yes so that's what i have to say so far how about you guys Go ahead, Jules. We need to humbly rely on God to keep our new heart clean because we can get dirty again. So we have to humbly rely on God to keep it clean. Amen. I agree. So this is a prayer we should be praying every day. Go ahead, Brandon. Yeah, uh, a verse of scripture that came to mind for me, Second Corinthians 5, verse 17, that says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And the last part of that, that verse really stood out to me, that all things are become new. Because, you know, oftentimes we like to compartmentalize our life. You know, the school version of us, the family version of us, the different parts of our life. and the the truth of giving God our hearts to make it new is that every single facet of our life has to be made new. When we're going to God for forgiveness, it's not just God help me to deal with this sin, but my other treasured sins will deal with that another time. Now, nah, the invitation to God is holistic. He wants every nook and cranny of our hearts and our lives to experience that newness. And it's like a cancer. You can't cut a cancer out of one part of the body and then you have like this big old fungating lesion on, on this person's hand and just be like, ah, cool, we'll deal, uh, deal with that another time. Yeah, God wants to fix up everything in us. And to do that, we have to give him all of us. And it's a word that we've discussed time and time again in Bible study, surrender. It's such a powerful word, but it's such a difficult thing well, at least I found in my life to do total surrender because partial surrender really isn't surrender. God wants all of us, every single part of us. And that surrendering bit is something that's only poss through, possible through the Holy Spirit because naturally the natural man doesn't want to relinquish control to somebody else. Amen. Amen. Thanks for that, Brandon. <clears throat> Anybody else has anything they want to add between verses 10 to 13? Um, something I have to add where it says renew a steadfast spirit. Oh, all right. 
um okay Jules I'll talk and then I'll just like, let you go okay <laughs> um where it says renew a steadfast spirit in me um one verse that I like to go back to when remembering what it means to be steadfast is first Corinthians 15 verse 58 that says therefore therefore my dear brothers and sisters stand firm let nothing move you always give yourself fully to the work of the lord because you know that your labor in the lord is not in vain i know reading that where it says always give yourself fully really comes in to what brandon just said um with fully surrendering yourself to god fully give yourself to him and um yeah just stand firm <laughs> um julie you can go ahead I love that, man. That's that's really powerful. Funny enough, that's actually is that the verse I'm saying? Uh, yeah, no. The yeah, verse ten, where it says, "Renew a loyal spirit within me." I kind of laughed when I when I read that because you know the whole story with Bathsheba, you know, cheating and all of that. But on a serious note, though, we really do have some cheating spirits within us sometimes. Meaning we're cheating on God, you know, our eyes stray too much to the left and we start looking on things that aren't of God. And uh, we need to, the same way how we need to renew our mind, sometimes we need to renew our spirit too because our spirit is, you know, because of our minds are, are going off, off track. So yeah, I like that David is asking to renew a loyal spirit within him. Amen. Love that. Go ahead, Brenda. Yeah, we're right up to verse 13, right, Rev? Yes, we did. Yeah, I find it fascinating here, just a progression of things. David is just like, yo, I've sinned and I'm seeking your forgiveness. And on that premise of forgiveness, I'll be able to go to transgressions and talk to them, transgressors, and talk to them about you. And I find that so interesting that it's on the the premise of his victory over his challenge that he's able to talk to somebody else about God. And, you know, a lot of times we think about, you know, the mistakes that we've made as, as bad things. And, you know, we do bad stuff, but the type of God that we serve is able to use our mistakes as a platform to win other people who are struggling with same, you know, imagine how powerful of a testimony it would be if, you know, for years, Julie or rabbit struggling with something and they gained the victory and they gain, and they experience the beauty of forgiveness in Jesus Christ, and they're able to come to me struggling with the same thing and encourage me in that same matter. You have no idea how powerful of a, a testimony and encouragement that can be to somebody who has been struggling for so long and can't see a way out. And then somebody comes and like, yo, God helped me to do this. God is forgiving. And he helped me through my mistake and he can do the same for you. So I was thinking, you know, Many of us may have made mistakes and God has given us victory over those things. And for some of the rest of us, we may still be on that experience of, you know, our victory journey. And God is saying to us, yo, I'm going to give you that victory. And on that platform, through you, I'm going to help other people as well. And I'm just like, look at God using like our bokto moments for his glory and our good. And not just our good, for other people's good as well. All glory to God, man. Amen. Amen. And for me, that tie, that t kind of ties into verse 12, where it says, restore to me the joy of your salvation, like just that joy of the deliverance from the grip of the devil on you, your restoration from eternal shame, just it must be joyful. And you receiving that joy you should be willing to go out and also share that joy of salvation with others. Hence, you can go out and teach your transitions, God's ways, and give your testimonies on how God has has saved you, how, ha how he has renewed you, and that can portray the joy of salvation to someone else. Um, yes. Any other points on those few verses before we move on to the next?
also one other thing i liked where it said grant me a willing spirit and for me this shows humility where you have to be able again to fully surrender yourself to god be willing to do what it is that god asks of you and in doing so it's the same thing you have to ask him every day for a pure heart to renew a steadfast spirit within you restore to you the joy of salvation and all these things i think will help in giving you that willing spirit also but you should also ask for that willing spirit go ahead brenda rav that is such a powerful point there was a, a church auntie of mine who i was having conversation with and she was like you know when she was struggling with something some prayer that god taught her to start praying is for him to make her willing to be made willing you know sometimes you know even getting to that that point of willingness is something that we struggle to do the willingness to to give god everything and the type of god that we serve is able to hear those prayers of lord i'm struggling to even be willing to 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 help you change my bad ways or even to come to you give me that willing spirit so that i'll be willing to be willing and that was just like a eureka moment for me because i've struggled with that you know and on one hand you say yo you want to overcome this and then two groups you, you just like was it the same lips and was this the same heart that that sought god so I, I like the way that your version translates it a willing heart for god to give us a willing heart i need a willing heart so i'm happy that god offers that Amen. I love that, Brandon. Thanks for that. Um, yes, I think we all need willing hearts. <laughs> um, any other thoughts before we move on to the next few verses? No? Okay. All right. I'll read from 14 to 17. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, you who are God my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, A broken and contrite heart, you, God, will not despise amen what do you guys get from these few verses anything that pops into your mind any thoughts Go ahead, Jules. I like that God can use my broken spirit. But you know, when you feel that low, you often feel like, you know, you can't be used or you don't have anything within you to, you know, offer it to God. But I hear it says, the sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O oh God. I like that. It reminds me of, I think it's in um, the Japanese culture where broken plates or broken china, I don't know which culture, I think it's a Asian culture, where the broken plates, they'll use uh, that gold to put back, put the pieces back together. That's the imagery that's in my mind while I'm reading this. So, you know, although we're broken god can still use our broken spirit as a matter of fact god wants our broken spirit to create that new piece that is put together even more beautifully with gold oh amen love that jules i love that um here what stands out to me is that um okay i'll let alina go first go ahead alina Oh no, I was gonna wait. Um, it's definitely really quick. I was just thinking back to what um, Vicky was saying earlier about you're never too far gone, you know, for Jesus. Because like even here, verse verse fourteen, save me from 
the guilt of bloodshed, God, God of salvation, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. I was just thinking of, you know, like sometimes based on the sin you do, some sort of, like I know all the sin are equal, you know, but like there's some sins out there where some people commit, man, where sometimes like when you look at even people that are in prison and certain things that they've done, like I know like them just teach somebody money or something like, you know what I mean? Like they've taken lives, they've, they've seriously hurt people, devastated other people's lives. And then something I've been coming across lately on TikTok is like the prison worship videos where like ministries going to the prisons and, and people get baptized and they repent and they're like singing, like they're literally singing of God's righteousness. And I'm just like, you know, I'm so happy that, you know, they've given their life over to God. And even some of them have to spend their whole life in their prison the same way, but you know, they've given their life to God. And sometimes I see where people in the comments will be like, you know, like they just don't think they're people, you know, and, and it, it begs the question, like, well, well, it just makes you remember these verses, like, listen, like you're never too far gone. Like sometimes when we say, oh, you're never too far gone, because none of us are really do certain things is like, you're thinking kind of to the limit of what you've done. But when I think about certain people where they've really done certain things that so other people can't even fathom, and then you still have to say to that person, hey, you are still not too far. It's just like a powerful, powerful thing. Like it's as long as you have breath in your lungs, you are still able to be redeemed and bring yourself to God. And so don't make that, don't make that breath run out and you never do it. You know what I mean? Because regardless of what's going on in your life, you can give your life to God. And I just think that's so beautiful. That's what I was like thinking about in that moment. Like, is everybody have to say that to people that wrong you, people that hurt you. Everybody is still after in mind that they're not too far gone. Amen. Thanks so much for that, Elena. Um, one other thing that I wanted to say as well that I got from these verses, um, where what he's saying, um, you do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offering. My sacrifice, oh God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. And for me, it just shows that God just wants you. God just wants your heart. And it makes me think about, you know, sometimes persons who are joining Christianity or even myself sometimes, and you feel like you need to clear up this or you need to push away that or you need to get everything in order before you come to God. God doesn't really need that sacrifice. God wants you first and then he can help you to sacrifice all those things that are bringing you down and that's what i get from this that he just only wants you he just wants your heart he just wants you to come to him first and not take up all these burdens on your own and it, now it's reminding me of matthew 11 um verses 28 where it says come to me all you who are weary and burdened and i will give you rest god just wants you he just wants you you don't have to um think that you have to come to him already clean already pure come to him with all your baggage everything and just give him your heart and he will help you to get rid of all those other things that need to be burnt away and gotten rid of so yes that's what i got um any other thoughts from you guys alina your hand is still up or it's from before oh it's from before okay. um yeah so anything else you guys have to add before we move on to the last two verses go ahead Rana. yeah i was just rereading the the context you were giving for the um david psalm here and i was mentioning it you know after david went ahead and committed adultery and then he murdered somebody and all of that lovely stuff he, the only time the chapter suggests that david became repentant was after nathan came into the picture and nathan what nathan came he said you know the son that your wife or that um, that she bore he will die in other words for a son to even exist at that time that is nine months post the actual sin in other words, 
it took nine months, assuming that, that that's the point when this happened, it took nine months for David to go to God and say, yo, this was, I did something wrong. And to me, you know, some people look at that and say, boy, David, this, this, that, blah, blah, blah. But to me, that deepens my appreciation of the forgiveness and the grace of God. That this man committed adultery, this man murdered, and it took nine months for him to go to God, and God was still forgiving. Imagine that. That's the merciful God that we serve. It's crazy when you really think about the context, you know. That's how long it took this man after God's own heart to, to go back to God. And despite that, God still forgave him. Now, if God can forgive that, then why is it that we, we don't think that God can forgive us? Why is it that we, we hesitancy approach the throne of grace? Nah, the, the, the depth and the nuance of David's situation is a proof in my mind that God's forgiving, forgiveness just ex exceeds what my mind can understand. So all glory to God, man. God is good. All the time. Amen. Amen. Love that. Especially when you put it into perspective. Wow. And it just it just kind of shows that um it's it's not too late. Like it took nine months for David to really come back to God. So I mean it's never too late to come back to God. Even in the last moments of your life, you can use those last few seconds, last few minutes to just go back to God, come back to God. It's not too late. So there's some comfort in that as well. Go ahead, Alina. I agree with what you're saying with like, you know, you can use your last moments, but something that, it's like sometimes I'm hesitant to say it to like, people who haven't given their life to God because they think they have time and I think I lived my life at one point like I had time as well like if you come across other young people they'll be like chum like the Christian thing of old people and them thing they're like right now I can live my life I can drink smoke party this that girl on the road be on the streets right day, day. like they think they can do all of that because they're young but then, God forbid, like, you never know. Look how much people we see in Jamaica, people who go to school with, that drive down the road, and that just ate that for them. You know what I mean? They're coming from a party, I enjoy themselves, and that that was it. You know what I mean? You don't know the day, you don't know the hour. People think that only applies to, like, God coming back. But literally, you never know, like, your what number your days are. You know what I mean? And it's like, sometimes when you tell young people, like, yeah, man, God just want you to come. Like, you're never too far gone. Like you have, like, you know, it doesn't matter, like you take, you took long and then, yeah, David took months, but then it's like, you know what I mean? It's, <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out the best way to communicate that. Cause like, I don't want to say you have to come tomorrow and then you rush the process because it, as, as, as we're saying through this whole conversation, it's a process because then there's that guilt and there's that shame that you have to unpack and that you have to rewire your brain against because the devil's trying to convince you and try to keep you down in that shame and the guilt that you're not supposed to be in, which is where David was. And it took him nine months to get out of that. But a lot can happen in nine months. You know what I mean? And it's like, I don't know. It's like, what's that balance between like when you're telling people, young people, especially young people about God and they're kind of caught up in a lifestyle, especially when the lifestyle is serving them. Because you have some young people, you know, they choose a certain lifestyle. And like, it's for instance, you have some, you have some young people that are a scam right now. Money running can buy big O's, big car. How do you convince those guys and say, hey, like, accept Jesus into your life? You know what I mean? You plant the seed and stuff, but, you know, I'm just trying to, like, say, like, sometimes I'm just wary to tell people that, like, you know, yeah, it took long or whatever, you can still come, because then when they hear that and they see people come to God later in life, they feel like they have the time. I don't know if you guys know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> I know there's no real answer to it, but it's, like, I just think that's, like, something to think about as well, that you don't that you, yeah, you have time, but you don't know how much time you have is essentially my point. Yeah, completely get you, Alina. That is, that is very, very true. That really is a sticky, sticky situation to bring to somebody. Because that is very true. A lot of young people, they're like, oh, you know, I just wanted my life now and then later on I give my life to God. But I know, I mean... 
I don't know. I don't know how to approach that. Go ahead, Vicky. And then Betty. Vicky? Uh, I'm not hearing. I don't know if it's me alone. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Rob. I think Vicky dropped off the call. Can you hear me, Rob? Okay. Yeah. All right. I'll just go to Betty P first and then um, give Vicky some time and then I'll come back. Okay, Betty P, go ahead. All right. Um, so while we're on the topic of death, um, one of the things that stood out from me from when we were doing, when Ravana was giving the introduction where um, one of the first things that came from the prophet's mouth, Nathan's mouth was after he confronted David was that you, you won't die, right? So um, when, you know, the wages, you know, the verse about the wages of sin is death. Um, a lot of times when we commit certain things, we're not thinking about that part of it. Like, I hope somebody can help. I'm still trying to process the, what I'm trying to say as well. But um, why, why do you think David's son died, like had to die? afterwards um you know the 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 trend that we see throughout the whole old testament is that okay if someone sins then this is you know the burnt offering that that is required to cover this sin like anytime someone sins the the penalty is that there has to be some bloodshed to cover that sin so it's kind of morbid to think about, but if anybody else, um, I'm, I'm not sure if there's an explanation for it, but why do you think that David, that the penalty had to be that um, his son would die? Yeah, that's the question. It's a question and a thought. Let me, let me know if anybody thought of that as well. Uh, yeah. Um, the floor is open for anybody. I honestly don't know. I don't know what to say about that. I understand what you're saying. I just don't. Yeah, um, I'm wondering if is <laughs> if is um. It's kind of morbid. I won't lie. It's kind of morbid, but um, I'm not saying that the sun blood was had to be shed to cover no i'm not saying that but i just wondering why you know because it's an innocent baby right yeah but it's just if maybe next time we can probably do some research and find out if there if anybody you know have some kind of commentary on it Maybe somebody, maybe some commentaries already out there have some kind of answer to that. But yeah, I, I was just, um, I was just shocked. Not really shocked because I, you know, I've read the story before, but it's just, I'm um, like the fact that Nathan was like, "You won't die," okay? Like, can you imagine every time I commit a sin, thinking about the possibility that, you know. Although we experience spiritual death, because you feel, a, you, you, well, we don't experience complete spiritual death, but you feel the effect of feeling kind of far from God, you know. And when Adam and Eve first seen, like, one of the consequences was, you know, they became spiritually dead, you know. So it's different forms of death. Like you have physical death, and you have. All right, that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> thanks for bringing it up, though, um, Betty. Thanks for that. I guess um, we'll just have to ponder our thoughts about that one or um, read about it, see if there's anything significant about it, and then we can talk about it at another time, maybe in the group or something. <clears throat> but thanks for bringing that up. 
Um, Vicky, are you okay now? Is the mic working? Uh-oh. Uh okay. All right. Well, you can always type if you want to. Um, yes. Okay. Any other comments? And before we read the last two verses. Go ahead, Brandon. Yeah, I was thinking about um, Elena's discourse and, you know, the balance in sharing. And I was just thinking, why is it that, that people people choose to, you know, defer Christianity to their later years after they've enjoyed all this life has to offer? And I was just, again, my mind just doing what it normally does. How good of a PR team have we been for the love of God? Is the choice of the world to delay their acceptance of Christianity an indictment on Christianity's PR team, us? In other words, have we done such a poor job of showing the world how amazing Christianity is? Yeah, a quick point. I agree with Brandon there, because honestly, the branding, <laughs> the branding wasn't too strong Like when I was growing up, I feel like. It's like, I think this is why community is very important. Like, this is why, like, stuff like even this space is important. Because I would say, like, this group helped a lot, like, with my journey and deciding to get baptized, right? Because when you kind of just go to church and you just leave, sometimes you don't really do nothing. You know what I mean? And then the same is the same way where some people don't grow up in spaces or homes that talk about Christianity or they didn't grow up with people around them that were Christian or they're not surrounded by like another space too that I'm seeing. Um, well, that I'm a part of now is like Christians in business, like in Toronto and stuff. You know what I mean? So it's like, I feel like creating those spaces as well within Christianity, like showing how you apply Christianity to every aspect of your life. Oh, you want to be an entrepreneur? This is how you apply godly principles in your business. Oh, you want to be a doctor or whatever? This is how like you're still going to pray for your patients, even though obviously we, we need you to be a skillful doctor because we know why you, you know, but you know what I mean? You know where God falls into that. You know where his place is. You know that he's the center of every single thing you do. And I feel like sometimes it's like, it kind of presents from the outside in. I'm just saying like prior to, you know, me being Christian and everything, like it's almost separate. Like, okay, you're Christian. Okay. And then now you're everything else. You know what I mean? But being Christian is the essence of who we are. Like being, being a follower of Jesus Christ is your identity. Right. And it's like, when it seems separate, I think that is why it's almost like it's hard for people to, to resonate with it or even look at you and try to emulate you. Because, like, you know what I mean? Like, there are people I've seen that are non-Christian, for instance, but they have things about them that I would emulate. You know what I mean? They could look towards and say, oh, like, you know, they're aspiring or they're inspiring in this space or in this way. And, oh, I want to be more productive like this person. Or, oh, I want to be good at X, Y, Z, just like this person. But imagine seeing a Christian doing well at something. And it's like, when they talk about this thing they're passionate about, they're like Christ at the center of it all. You know what I mean? It's like, that's what I'm trying to talk about. Like, if you could look at people and see that the essence of who they are and the way they move and navigate the world, their happiness, their joy, it stems from God. It's not who they're Christian. And then now they have all this, everything else going for them. And I think that is where that, <laughs> that branding is coming from, Brandon. Just like not seeing that disconnect because it's like you're preaching the gospel, but you're preaching it on Sunday and you're already preaching at a Bible study. But, the, but the, the gospel should be felt in every single thing that you're doing, the way you carry yourself, everything that you're talking about, insert God. And then they'd be like, oh, like, you're this way because of God. You know what I mean? But they can't, they can't, they can't connect it. They can't connect it. And I think that is, like, a part of it. And then, again, like, just creating spaces um, where you can be Christian, but you're doing, you're doing things besides church and Bible study. Like I remember getting a comment one time where someone was like, why are you doing picnic Bible study? You're not supposed to do all that. Da, da, da. And I was like, what you mean? We're not supposed to go on the grass and read the Bible and eat food. What are you talking about? You know what I mean? So it's like, you have to <laughs> create these spaces where people feel welcome. And yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. 
Love that, love that, Alina. I think you put that like very, very well. I couldn't. I don't think it could be said any, any better. That really put things into perspective for real. And um, question that Julie said: Do you guys think that you're living a separated life? I guess that's something that you have to think about and resonate with what Alena said and yeah fix up what needs to be fixed up and yeah but that's very true Alena honestly I don't have anything to add I just really agree with what you said and also um, Vicky had said um, read what Alena said I was trying I was saying the hardest part for me in sharing about God is the persons who actually experience God how do you encourage someone to turn their life around and tell them about how God is when they were baptized, etc.? So, question to you guys. I feel like that that is a really hard one. So, anybody has any insight on that or any advice on that? Would that be a case of... Oops, sorry, I didn't raise my hand. Would that be a case of them needing to just reignite the Holy Spirit within them? Because you can't lose the Holy Spirit, you know. Well, you know what I mean. Like, <laughs> like it's just like, where was it? We're reading it earlier. Um, Restore the joy of my salvation to me, verse 12, and sustain me by giving me a willing spirit. Like, I don't know if it's more like that where someone knew God. I feel like those are the hardest people sometimes to even bring because then they knew God and then they, 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 they drifted so far. But I think they're exactly where David David was. You know what I mean? So it's like a matter of of restoring what was already there and reigniting the faith that they have. But yeah, I, I, I get what Vicky's saying. Like, that can be tough. I think you just keep the pressure on. That's what I would say. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't know what to say about it to be honest but then if you pressure them it's like you have to think about your um, approach as well because the pressure on them could I even force them further so um, go ahead Brandon yeah it, it, it's such an important question and I think one that needs time to be answered I don't know if we'll be able to flesh it out all the way tonight but there's a verse that um, Daniel often quotes where it's I can't remember we're in the New Testament, but we're like one man plant a seed and somebody else do something and the Holy Spirit the maturity. I think that's the approach that we have to have where we understand, I hope you hear me because I said Chipotle a while ago. But yeah, where we understand that, you know, everybody who in the moment wants to accept Jesus may not like accept him right away, but we trust God to work in their lives and we trust him to help us know what role we ought to play. And you're right, a lot, sometimes if you pressure some people too much, that can be the, the turn-off factor for them. So number one, living a consistent life is something that people respect and will gravitate to. And if you encourage from a place of love as opposed to like, um, yo, if you don't do this, then these are the bad things that are going to happen. That never works. Simply live the love of God, speak the love of God and allow people to experience and feel that. And then share with people your testimony. We've talked about it so much, but the power of a testimony is something in my mind that somebody can't argue with. Somebody can argue with you about a Bible verse, but they can't argue with you about your experience with God. So talk to them about that and trust that God will, you know, continue to work through other people, through experiences, and just trust God to do what he says he will do. Don't try to take up the work of the Holy Spirit on yourself. Amen. I love that. Brandon, I love that those suggestions for you um vicky i hope that helped your question or whoever else also had that question yes um we only have two verses left i'm just going to read and then we just read. um verses 18 to 19 may it please you to prosper zion to build up the walls of jerusalem then you will delight in the sacrifices of the righteous in burnt offerings offered whole. Then both will be offered on your altar. Amen. Um, what I really got from this, these last two verses is just, <clears throat> I think at this point, um, 
outside his music somebody in the room i think at this point david just realized that in his sin he never really just feel as a man but remember that he was like a king like the greatest of the israel kings and i feel like at this point he just got some insight of how much he had failed at being king over god's people so this was just him like humbly asking god to restore his favor to the kingdom um that's what i got from these last two verses i don't know about you guys <clears throat> yeah um all right, just to um, just to read this um, thing I had seen, um, just to tie in everything together. Um, so at the beginning, at the beginning of the journey, a person must recognize God's greatness in relation to their own unworthiness. It is necessary to admit one's sin and one's weaknesses. It is important to repent and pray for forgiveness, but it is also important to humbly accept the forgiveness which is offered and then to joyfully experience the healing, redemption, and deliverance. It is important to immerse yourself in the wisdom of God, which alone brings stability to human life. And finally, it is important to persist in glorifying God and giving thanks for all that he has done. Amen. So I just feel like this just really summed up this whole chapter with everything. Um, so yeah, that's all I have to say. And do you guys have anything else that you want to add before we actually close out? Um, let me see what Piki said. I have prayed a similar prayer, I think, where I'm like, I hope my purpose will still be fulfilled even though I have not been all that good. What do you mean, Vicky? Um, I feel like I'm confused. I feel like I don't know where this comment drops in. Um, can somebody help me? <laughs> Is it in, in terms of the question that you had posted before? Uh, go ahead, Alina. I think I'm a bit confused. Um... When I, I don't know where this really drop in with what you were saying, Rav, but oh. <laughs> oh, that's what Vicky's saying. I was when I read Vicky's comment, I was thinking about how we all have a purpose, but you can miss your destiny still, you know. Let's say you're caught up in sin and you just don't get it together. You don't come to God. It's like what you had in store for you. Sometimes you can miss it. I really believe that. I feel like sometimes because we have free will and you can dilly dally, dilly dally and run away your whole life and miss it. So I don't know if that's what Vicky was, that's what I thought she was saying, like that you you want to be used and you want to come to God and repent so you can be used by God fully for the purpose that he has and the will that he has over your life. But you don't want to miss that opportunity to be used in a very powerful way um, because you're there dilly-dallying. Because some people like, I don't know, people say, yeah, God have a purpose for your life and it can't miss you. But I believe it can miss you because if you don't accept the call, how will it be fulfilled? You know what I mean? So that's what I was thinking about when Vicky wrote that comment. Because at the end of the day, you know, you may have the call on your life. But if you don't answer, if you don't pick up the phone, how are you going to do it? So that's what I was thought. That's what I thought she was talking about. But <laughs> I don't know. Um, yes. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have anything to add. Vicky, is that okay? I... Don't, I... Um, okay. <laughs> um, well, yes, I don't have anything else to say. And if you guys also don't have anything else to say, then verse 18. Hold on, let me quickly. Um, oh, may it please you to prosper Zion to build up the walls of Jerusalem. Um, oh gosh, Vicky, I wish I could speak. <laughs> Because I don't know what to say. <laughs> um. 
you hearing me? Uh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so when I read that, that says, may it please you. So after all of that, you know, pouring out and everything, when I read verse 18, what I got from it was, may it please you to prosper Zion, to build up the walls of Jer Jerusalem. What I felt, what I got from it was him basically saying, may it, though I know I will face consequences for what has what I have done, I still hope it pleases you that the purpose is fulfilled. May Zion still be prospered. Because you same one said it, Rav, that he's still king. So he's still thinking of his kingdom. You know, so in my mind, I'm thinking he's saying, you know, I know I haven't done a good job at being your servant, but I do stay I do still hope that my my kingdom will prosper and not suffer as a consequence of my actions. I do still hope. So for me personally, when I make that prayer personal, it's like, Lord, I know right now I'm not like your perfect child right now, but I do hope that, you know, the purpose that you have in me will still be fulfilled. So that's what I, that's how I connect myself to verse 18. And I have like 1% left on this phone. So I'm switching again. <laughs> Okay, now I understand, Vicky. Okay, thank you so much. I fully understand what you meant now. And yes, yes, I agree with you. I I understand what you're saying. I don't I still don't have anything to add to it. I just like how you interpreted it. I like your thought behind it. So thank you. Um yes. Just going to ask again. Anybody else has anything they want to say before we close out? If not, then we are at the end of Bible study today. Um, just want to say thank you for everybody for joining. Thank you for communicating and putting in your thoughts and having this discussion. I learned so much from you guys. And yeah, it was a really powerful Bible study as always. So thank you guys very much. And now we will just close out as we... Thanks, Vicky. <laughs> we'll just close out as we usually do um, with our prayer chorus and our prayer request this. Um, so I'm not sure how many volunteers we'd need today, but I'm sure we need one person to sing a prayer chorus for us and two volunteers to pray. So three volunteers in all. One person to sing, one person to, two persons to pray, sorry. So any volunteers? I can do prayer one. Thanks, Elena. Um, so one more person to pray and one person to sing. I can sing. So just one more person to pray. Sorry, Brandon, that was you. Okay, all right, thank you. All right. Create in me a clean heart, O oh Lord, and renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O oh Lord, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, O oh Lord. And take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. And renew a right spirit within me. Thanks, Rev. Bow your heads for prayer. Lord of God, we come before you tonight and this morning just to say thank you, God. Thank you for another Friday where we're able to come together as a group and just worship you, God, and just talk about the word, dear God, that you have given us. Dear God, we just want to say thank you for being you. Thank you for your grace and your mercies, dear God, and keeping us safe and allowing us to come to meet tonight. 
Dear God, and I pray a blessing over those that are here and also those a part of the group that were not able to make it tonight for whatever reason, dear God. And I just pray that every week we will see this group grow further and further and continue to be used, dear God, to build up your kingdom. Dear God, tonight I bring before you Vic Vicky, and she's praying for spiritual strength and discipline to walk in holiness, dear God. And I think this is a prayer that we all have, dear God, but we bring before you specifically Vicky tonight, dear God, because she's just asking for strength and discipline in a world full of distractions, in a world that is trying to pull us away, dear God, from you every single day, dear God. We need your help, dear God, to just stay firm in the foundation that is you, Jesus. Dear God, I pray over Vicky, dear God, and that you will direct her path, dear God, that you will direct everything that she does, dear God, that you will not have her fall to, dear God, that no weapon of the enemy will prosper against her life dear god that you will just strengthen her each and every day dear god as she walks as she talks as she moves dear god that she will not walk in fear dear god but she will walk in faith and that she'll walk in strength dear god that is a firm foundation that is you dear god that she knows that she has dear god and she's also praying for stability in all aspects of her life her career her personal relationship her home her finances and in ministry dear god you have used vicky Dear God, in so many spaces, dear God. She has been in different countries. She's been in different spaces. She's touched so many lives, dear God. She doesn't even know how many lives that she's touched with her presence, dear God, and just how that she walks, dear God, as a woman of God and is used by you, dear God. And I pray, dear God, that she continues to go into different spaces, dear God. She continues to navigate this life that you've given her, dear God, that she puts you at the center of it all, dear God, as she navigates her career, her personal relationships, her home, her finances, dear God. I pray for breakthrough, dear God, over her finances, dear God. I pray for opportunity, dear God, when it comes to career, dear God. I pray for opportunity to speak and to minister when it comes to the space of ministry. Dear God, I pray for a God-centered relationship in her life, dear God, whether it be romantic, whether it be her friends, her family, dear God, whatever it is, dear God, this relationship, dear God. I pray, dear God, that you're at the center in the way that they treat each other and the way that they speak to each other, dear God, the way that Vicky deals with people, dear God, I pray. Dear God, that you're at the center of it all, God. In her home, dear God, I pray that peace will reign, dear God, in her home, dear God, her home in Jamaica, the home, wherever she is right now in the world. I don't even know where Vicky's at, dear God, but you know where she's at, dear God. So whatever home this is, dear God, every home that she steps foot in, dear God, that peace, dear God, will enter that space. Dear God, I pray for breakthrough with the finances, dear God. I pray for also just being able to steward, dear God, what it is that she, whatever it is that you give her, dear God, that she will be able to manage whatever it is that you give her, dear God, the opportunities, dear God, I pray, dear God, for preparation, dear God, as we pray for opportunity for her and everybody in this group, dear God, whatever it is that they need that has not been put in the prior chat today, dear God, that you will also prepare us, dear God, that whatever it is that we're praying for, that we will be prepared to receive that blessing, dear God, and to multiply, dear God, and that you'll be able to use us, dear God. Tonight, dear God, we read Psalm 51, dear God, and you, we, for David asks, dear God, you create a clean heart and renew the steadfast spirit within him, dear God, and that, you know, the presence of the Holy Spirit will not be removed from him, dear God, and that he will have a restored joy in you, dear God, and we pray for that restoration tonight, dear God. Anybody here tonight, anybody in the group, in the wider group, dear God, that needs restoration right now, that is far from you, dear God, that, also, that doesn't even feel like coming out to the Bible studies right now because of how far Dear God, they feel that they are from you, dear God, that you remind them that you have not moved, dear God, that you will never move, dear God, that you are right there. And they just need to open up their eyes, dear God, and unplug their ears, dear God, and listen to your voice, dear God, and to feel your spirit, dear God, because you are calling your children. Dear God, I ask, dear God, that everybody here, dear God, you use Vicky in the spaces as you continue to use her, dear God, but you also use each and every one of us here, dear God, as stewards in this earth, dear God, we will walk, dear God, and we will be, we will we will fulfill the commission, dear God, to spread your gospel, dear God, that we will not be afraid, dear God, to speak our testimonies, dear God, that we will use a testimony, dear God, their experiences that you've given us, dear God, the ways that you've blessed us to bless others and bring others to you, God. I just pray for protection over our lives, dear God, as we navigate this upcoming week, this weekend, dear God, that you just continue to watch over us and protect us and keep us safe, dear God, and keep us aware, dear God. I just pray for discernment as well, dear God, as we navigate this life as young people, Dear God, just thank you, dear God, and just continue to bless this group as we close out tonight. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I come before you again saying thanks for being God. Thanks for being our friend. Thanks for being 
a forgiving savior. And God, God read, read tonight and reminded of how beautiful and large and how unquantifiable your grace and your mercy is. And for that, I say thank you, Jesus. God, tonight I come to you on behalf of your daughter, Lena. God, she is requesting a prayer for focus on the things that you have called her to do. God, even right now, I ask that you make certain in her mind that which you have called her to be and do. God, when the distractions of life surround her mighty Savior, I ask that you give her focus, that you'll help her to keep her eyes not on the stormy waves around her, but on you, the author and finisher of her faith, Almighty Savior. God, I ask that when circumstances would seek to derail her, that you would remind her that her feet are founded on the solid rock, Jesus Christ. God, I ask that whatever distractions are around her space even now, that you hush them, that you quiet them. And even if those storms aren't quieted, oh God, that you help her to have peace and focus despite the distractions. God, for those things that are seeking to pull her away from her relationship with the Almighty Savior, God, I ask that even now you step on the head of the enemy, Almighty Savior, and remind him that he is an already defeated foe, Almighty God. Acts day after day, you continue to provide stepping stones for Elena to grow in her purpose, to grow deeper and closer with you, Almighty Savior, that every word she speaks, every action she does will glorify your name. And that somebody will get to know you as personal Lord and Savior through her testimony, Almighty Savior. God, if there's anything, Elena, hasn't written in this request, oh God, but you know the desires of her heart, God, I ask that even now you fulfill according to your word. God, Lee is also praying for their family, her sister, sister especially, as she's going through a lot at the moment, and only you can fix it. God, the words of Lee are absolutely true, oh God. Any problem in our life, only you can be the solution. So God, even right now, I ask that you step in, that you intervene, and that you do what only you can do, Almighty Savior. God, I ask that you mend, that you restore, that you deliver whatever needs to be done, oh God. I ask that you do it according to your will, Almighty Savior. And that the end, that the beautiful, happy home that Lee and her family members will be able to experience will glorify your name, Almighty Savior. God, if there were any prayer requests that weren't submitted tonight, even though, God, you know the desires of their heart, I ask that you provide comfort to somebody who needs it. I ask that you provide peace to somebody who needs it. That even right now you embrace someone who is feeling low. That you provide the joy to the spirit to a person right now who is feeling overwhelmed. God, I give you thanks in advance that you even know the things that we need before we even know what we need. That's the type of guy that you are, a loving friend. And God, even as we pray all these things, the most important prayer that we can pray is a prayer that calls for surrender, the prayer that we desperately want to have in our hearts, oh God, where we give ourselves entirely to you. So even though, oh God, every member of work in progress, God, we pray the prayer of David that you create in us a clean heart and that you renew within us a right spirit. Now, ultimately, when you come, each and every person will be able to hear the words, well done, and that we'll be able to, just like this, gather around the throne of the Lamb and keep another work in progress, and you'll be right by our side, guiding us through the ceaseless ages of eternity. Thank you, O God, that despite the fact that we're born and shaped in iniquity, that you have called us to a higher standard and empower us to live that standard. I bless your name, God, and I give you thanks. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen, 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 amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Alina, and thanks, Brandon. And thank you so much again, everyone, for coming out to Bible study. I hope you learned a lot, have things to ponder on for the weekend um, and for the rest of your life. <laughs> um, hope to see you guys again next week, same time. Have a great weekend. Have a great week, guys. God bless you all. Bye.